The Zodiac Killer story is a true crime legend, yet his identity is still unknown. A new HBO Max series claims they may know who the Zodiac Killer was. Yes, another one. And as with many suspects over the years, a family member has made the accusation. Where this accusation differs from other family accusations is that the new suspect isn't only accused of being the Zodiac, but another infamous serial killer as well. Join Bad Things as we examine the new Zodiac killer suspect, Jim Mordecai. Is there substantial evidence to lump him in with the rest of the possible Zodiac suspects? What counts against him being a strong suspect, and could he be the suspect in a rash of decades-old serial killings that some investigators have attributed to the Zodiac? Max's docuseries The Truth About Jim builds a case for Jim Mordecai's possible connection to the infamous Zodiac serial killer case, but the truth regarding the degree of his involvement is predictably convoluted. The four-episode series follows Sierra Barter as she unearths years of family trauma to determine if her step-grandfather Jim was one of the most renowned murderers of the 20th century. However, although the truth about Jim presents some coincidental evidence, the argument is not as straightforward as many would want. Throughout the four episodes, Barta recounts the history of her step-grandfather and the generational brutality her family suffered at his hands. Mordecai looked to be a regular high school teacher and parent at a glance, but as Barta dug deeper, she uncovered that her step-grandfather was a violent, abusive monster who may just be an infamous serial killer. Mordecai was born to Evelyn and Harold Mordecai on August 27, 1941, in San Rafael, California. Mordecai attended Santa Rosa schools from kindergarten to high school, graduating from Montgomery High School in 1960. He excelled in athletics, notably football. He earned a bachelor's degree from Chico State University in 1965, and an agricultural teaching degree from the University of California, Davis, in 1966. After a year of student teaching at Heldsburg High School, Mordecai spent 25 years teaching at Half Moon Bay High School in California. After retiring from teaching, Mordecai worked briefly as a landscape architect and was in real estate at the time of his death. However, according to his family members, Mordecai led a double life. The documentary features accounts from several members of Barta's family, including her grandmother and Jim's third wife, Judy, her mother, Shannon, and Mordecai's children and stepchildren from his first and second marriages. The Truth About Jim, which begins as a discussion of domestic, mental, emotional, and sexual abuse, quickly turns into an investigation of whether Mordecai was an infamous serial killer. During Barta's interview with her mother, Shannon, she acknowledged reporting Mordecai to the police as a teenager. Instead of helping or investigating, the authorities discounted Shannon's allegations, concluding that she was merely feeling hormonal resentment for her stepfather. Jamie, Mordecai and Jean Kirkpatrick's biological daughter, related horrific accounts about the trauma she endured throughout her childhood in Mordecai's home. One notable story included a time in which a 15-year-old Jamie was suffering from a scoliosis flare-up, and when Mordecai came to her room upon hearing her in pain, instead of helping, raped her. Christy, Kirkpatrick's daughter, shared an intriguing tale during the interviews. When Christy thought she was about to uncover Mordecai's misconduct, the 13-year-old fought back against her stepfather's attacks, leaving him with a cut on his face. When questioned, Mordecai lied, blaming the mark on his razor and concealing the fact that he had tried to harm his stepdaughter. Shannon's allegations concerning Mordecai were not the only ones that were dismissed. In one interview, Mordecai's wife from 1972 until 1983, Jean, discussed her ex-husband's violent behavior. Kirkpatrick was first drawn to Mordecai's fatherly influence on her children, but she quickly realized he was putting up a front. He became obsessed with Kirkpatrick, and she began worrying about her and her children's lives. After her children were exposed to violence and sexual assault in her home, Mordecai forced a loaded revolver into Kirkpatrick's mouth 
after she demanded a divorce. Although many criminals would logistically want to avoid being identified with their crimes, Mordecai employed a different strategy. Mordecai's students said that he had sexually assaulted them in his secluded cabin, while others believed that they had barely escaped being sexually assaulted by him. However, it was unexpectedly discovered that Mordecai himself was responsible for the fabrication of many of these stories. The boasting about his misdeeds varied, but they all had one thing in common. They had him having sexually explicit contact with female pupils. During the first half of the series, a grim picture is painted of the violent pedophile. But what does this have to do with the Zodiac? In one episode, Shannon recounts the story of a late-night car trip with Mordecai, where she felt that he was going to murder her on a secluded road. Barter doesn't specify why or how, but it reminded her of Kathleen John's supposed encounter with the Zodiac. On March 22, 1970, 22-year-old Kathleen Johns drove from San Bernardino to Petaluma to see her mother. She was traveling with her newborn daughter and was seven months pregnant. At around 11.15 p.m., while traveling on a deserted road, a car pulled up next to her and a man behind the wheel started pointing for her to pull over. When she agreed, the driver approached her window and told her that her left rear wheel was loose but that he could fix it for her. He took a tire iron and loosened the nuts instead of tightening them. So when he gave her the go-ahead and she tried to drive away, the wheel came off. The stranger then offered her a ride to a service station, which she accepted. But once Johns and her baby were in his vehicle, it was evident that the driver had other intentions for her. The man started driving at high speeds, disregarding stop signs, and refused to slow down. According to a 1998 interview, John said that the driver started telling her, you know you're gonna die, right? I'm gonna kill you. Knowing that the vehicle would not stop or even slow down, John's pulled her infant to her chest, grabbed the door handle, jumped and rolled. Fortunately, a trucker saw what had happened and stopped to help. The trucker took John's to a nearby police station to file a complaint, but as she was doing so, she saw a police sketch. I looked up on the wall and there was one of those composite drawings of the person who I'd just spent this time with, she said. It turns out it was the Zodiac, and I didn't know who that was at the time. Despite John's later protestations, none of the police reports actually mention the man threatening her life. And although a letter written by Zodiac months later indicated enjoying a rather interesting ride with a woman and her child, it featured none of the customary details that his stories were renowned for, raising the possibility that he was trying to claim credit for something he read in the press. Barta would then go down the Zodiac rabbit hole like many before her. Barta claims that she went down the Zodiac hole out of curiosity and wanted to see if her violent step-grandfather fitted the bill. Her suspicions were tweaked when Barta and her mother compared pictures of Mordecai and the famous police composite photo of the Zodiac. They also saw similarities in his physical attributes. Jim had a stocky athletic build, Barter would say, comparing Mordecai to the Zodiac. Barter has a photograph of Mordecai wearing red-tinted glasses, also attributed to the infamous killer. Barter's next clue was a shoe print. After the Lake Berryessa attack, detectives discovered a trail of discernible footprints heading to and from the crime scene. After careful examination, it was revealed that the footwear that had shaped them were wing walkers, a kind of low-cut military boot, a size 10 and a half boot. Mordecai wore a size 10 and a half shoes. Barter's evidence trail ends with a trip to Lake Berryessa to match a photograph of Mordecai sitting on a boat to the area where the Zodiac struck in 1969. Unfortunately, she was unsuccessful. Barta presented her evidence to Michael Butterfield, a writer who has researched the Zodiac case extensively since the 1990s. As a renowned leading authority on unsolved cases, he has worked as a media source and consultant for news stories, television documentaries, a History Channel series, and directed David Fincher's major motion film Zodiac. After looking at the evidence, Butterfield bluntly told Barter that it was doubtful that Mordecai was the Zodiac, 
and how many people who had suspected one of their family members had ruined their lives with it. While striking out on the Zodiac angle, Barta may be onto something linking her sadistic step-grandfather to another unsolved series of serial killings. The Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders Serial murder was rampant in the United States throughout the early 1970s. In fact, by the middle of the decade, FBI profiler Robert Ressler came up with the phrase serial killer during interviews with Herb Mullen, Edmund Kemper, and Monty Rissell. Ressler's in-depth investigation into the mental processes of sexual sociopaths led him to become the world's leading authority on serial murder. Between 1972 and 1973, one of Ressler's monsters cruised the streets of Santa Rosa, California, searching for unsuspecting victims. Within two years, at least seven young women suffered sexual abuse, were tortured and killed by an unknown perpetrator. The Santa Rosa Hitchhiker Murders cold case now has yet another suspect, according to Barta. The first known victims were Maureen Sterling, 12, and Yvonne Weber, 13. At about 9 p.m. on Friday, February 4, 1972, they told their friend at the Redwood Empire Ice Arena in Santa Rosa that they were going to smoke marijuana with an older man. This was the last time they were seen alive. Maureen and Devon's skeletal remains were discovered roughly around 30 minutes' drive away from the ice arena and two hours away from Mordecai's home in Half Moon Bay. Barker reiterated throughout the documentary that he would take long drives without explaining where he was going, insinuating that maybe he committed these murders on one of his drives. Another coincidence is that the family cabin is also situated in Santa Rosa, close to the girls' dump site. Binding materials recovered at the site indicated that they were restrained. Their clothes were never found, although detectives discovered a 14-carat gold necklace with a crucifix belonging to Maureen and a single earring and orange beads. After his death, Barter's mother, Shannon, remembers discovering a box of weird one-piece trinket jewelry, including orange beads, among Mordecai's possessions. Unfortunately, the box was thrown away. In the documentary, Barter interviewed the girl's friend who saw the man they left with, and when showed a picture of Mordecai, she acknowledged that he may be the same person. On March 4, 1972, Kim Allen, 19, hitched a 15-minute ride from Larkspur, California, to the 101's northbound ramp in San Rafael. The men who gave her a ride were absolved of wrongdoing and said they last saw her at 5.20 p.m. when they dropped her off. Her corpse was discovered the next day, March 5th, near the bottom of an embankment in Santa Rosa. She had been tied, raped, and strangled with a wire. Her killer sperm was extracted from her body as evidence. Mordecai's DNA was handed to police in the documentary's last episode, but the findings have yet to be made public. Laurie Curser, a 13-year-old habitual runaway, went missing somewhere between November 20th and November 30th, 1972. Her mother last saw her on November 11th, before she left to visit friends in Santa Rosa, who last saw her on the 20th or 21st. Later, two witnesses came forward, claiming to have seen her with a white man with an Afro-style hairdo, driving a van. Laurie Cursor, naked corpse, was discovered on December 14th off Calistoga Road in Santa Rosa. Six years later, an unnamed Jane Doe was discovered about a hundred yards from where Laurie Cursor was found. Her arm was broken. She had been hogtied and thrown into a duffel bag. Police thought she died between 1972 and 1974. Mordecai served as the high school group's counselor at Future Farmers of America meetings in Santa Rosa in August and November 1972. The latter event took place on November 30, 1972. Carolyn Davis, a 15-year-old runaway who went missing from the 101 in Gerberville, California on July 15, 1973. Carolyn's elder sister, Judy, said that Carolyn informed her she had run away after witnessing a double murder. Carolyn's corpse was discovered on July 31, 1973, only three feet away from Maureen and Devon's remains. 
A pathologist confirmed that she died from strychnine poisoning around July 20th. Investigators were unable to ascertain if the poison that killed her was administered or consumed, or whether she had been raped. Another victim found seems to exactly fit the circumstantial evidence offered in The Truth About Jim, which alleges Mordecai's participation in the Santa Rosa hitchhiker murders. Teresa Diane Smith Walsh, 23, went missing on December 22, 1973, while hitchhiking from Zuma Beach in Malibu to Gerberville to see her mother for Christmas. Kayakers found her corpse six days later, precisely one year after Maureen and Devon were recovered in Mark West Creek, west of Santa Rosa. The specifics of Teresa's death are very disturbing. Police assumed she had been deposited up the stream and her corpse had been carried to its final position during severe rains. Like the other victims, she was naked. She'd been hogtied, with her thumbs securely wrapped together. Her left eye was injured, and there was an injury to the back of her skull. A nylon rope wrapped from her ankles to a noose around her neck, forcing her to keep her body uncomfortably bent to breathe, creating an impossible scenario that progressively suffocated her. Mordecai's family have all agreed on one thing. He often mentioned hog-tying women and slashing their throats. Did Jim Mordecai kill Teresa? No. Somehow, the documentary crew and Mordecai family overlooked what seems to be a critical element, a date and event that was shown in archival footage in the documentary. On the same day that Teresa Diane Smith Walsh vanished in Malibu, Jim Mordecai was getting married to Jean Probst in Half Moon Bay. Zuma Beach in Malibu is nearly six hours away from where Jim Mordecai was joined by friends and family the whole day, as seen on video footage in The Truth About Jim. Does this completely exonerate him? No, not yet. However, it provides reliable evidence that contradicts the documentary's circumstantial evidence. Simply put, he couldn't have been in two places simultaneously. Jim Mordecai could not have murdered Teresa Walsh. But as we've said before, California was infested with serial killers in the 1970s. Did another serial killer coincidentally dump their victim in the Santa Rosa killer's graveyard? There is no argument that Jim Mordecai was a monster that escaped justice. But was he the Zodiac? Highly unlikely. Was he the Santa Rosa hitchhiker murderer? We'll have to wait and see.